and welcome to a podcast in space and time. Uh, my name is Kendall Coffey, and this is Holden B. Huffman. And today we're talking about Doctor Who Season 1, Episode 5 of World War Three. So we're going to go ahead and watch the episode, and we'll get right back to you. And we're back. Uh, so, what did you think about the episode? I mean, it was less enjoyable than the previous episode, but For it was sure. still more enjoyable than the Unquiet Dead. I don't know why I keep going back to the Unquiet Dead, but... I don't know. I got, honestly, I kind of found this one less enjoyable than that one. I, I got bored in this oh, one. Really? I got real bored, yeah. There was there was a point where I kind of like started to zone out, and then I'm like, oh, I should <laughs> I should not zone out and like actually be paying attention and taking notes. But it was kind of hard. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that's how I was with the Unquite Dead. But maybe it was I was more like that for the Unquite Dead because I literally did just work a seven hour shift. So that yeah. might and I was I was really tired. I was dead tired. So that might have just had something to do with it. Yeah, I mean, of the two, I kind of found this one to be. I don't know, to be less enjoyable than that one. Uh, this, And I think, like, probably the problem with this one, especially, is that it, like, was part two of something that really probably didn't need two parts. That is true. It really could have survived being a one-parter. Yeah. Um, I don't think, really, the, the premise was strong enough to carry two mm-hmm. episodes. I did, like, I did really enjoy the whole... I enjoyed the plan or the the scheme of this Levine. I thought it was it was a really interesting. Yeah, plan. like it's not the normal. Oh, we want to take over the world. Blah, 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 blah. No, they literally wanted to like nuke the whole world and sell it for parts, which is kind of hilarious. But you don't really, right? You don't really get that until like halfway through the episode. And no. like, yeah, if these two parts were a movie, that's like not figuring out what the villain's scheme is until like. <clears throat> you know, an hour and a half into the film. That was, that's insane. Right. That, that's usually what makes a bad movie. Yeah. And like, I don't know. I I feel like I probably would have been more invested if like maybe they had dropped the big plan reveal at the end of the last episode. And then like Mm -hmm. for the entire episode, you could kind of have the tension of like, Oh no, they're going to nuke the whole planet. And like, right. Once they get, once they get access to these codes, but like, It's like you don't even like after, you know, they're trying to get nuclear codes, you still don't know what they're going to do with them. And I Mm -hmm. I think that kind of like, I don't know that they they couldn't really hold the tension because I don't don't know what they want these codes for. (laughs) And honestly, I think that's a major problem with a lot of Doctor Who two parter episodes is that in the first part, they have like a really big cliffhanger. But in the second part, the that really big thing is just kind of resolved with a snap of super quickly. Yeah. Super quickly. It's like, Oh, okay. (laughs) Yeah. The doctor just like pulls the thing off because like he's a time Lord and it doesn't affect him the way it does a human. And right. Yeah. It's like it. Yeah. It's like every single like cliffhanger that they set up was just like immediately resolved. And there Mm -hmm. was really no, like, and it's, it's why I enjoy I can't think of any examples right now, but I, I, there there are certain episodes. I feel like it happened a couple of times in Matt Smith's era where, like, you had the cliffhanger, and mm-hmm. then the next episode, like, things have just like changed drastically, and you can't really quite get your yeah. bearings for the first few minutes. Right. Um, like, uh, oh, the one I'm thinking of is uh, part one of. Um, this is spoilers. We'll get into it later. But yeah, I was about to say. Yeah, I, I, we we won't talk about that right now. But there, there's there's an episode mm-hmm. during Matt Smith's run that really like shows what I'm talking about. But I, and I think they could have done something similar here, where like maybe you know maybe we have like a bit of a time skip, like a couple of hours, and like you know mm-hmm. everybody's in like different places than they were and there's some kind of plan like kind of coming together but like we're not really quite sure what it is yet um, right and then like you know as that is happening we kind of figure out like what they did to like resolve the situation mm. i feel like they did that perfectly with the series finale of this season the the two-parter i felt like mm-hmm. that was a good cliffhanger 
and it was resolved nicely with that it wasn't just a little oh uh, i do this one little thing which i'm not going to get into i probably won't even get into it into the spoiler section because i mean we're going to get into that episode not we're going to get into that episode very soon so yeah so yeah maybe we'll 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 save that bit of discussion for the end but um Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know it's just like i'm i'm with you there the resolution was just way too simple for the Mm -hmm. and also how did the slovene 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 whatever how did all of them get affected by the electricity like I always hate that. Like one thing happens to one. It's like a hive mind. I've never been a fan of hive minds. Like, like, in, like the Phantom Menace, you destroy the mothership, it kills all of them. That was my biggest gripe with the first Avengers movie was that they destroyed the big ship and it just destroyed all the Chitari. And like yeah, they just it- all died down. I'm like, well, that was I mean, it, was- it made more sense in the Phantom Menace, I feel like, mm-hmm. than it did in the Avengers, because, like, I don't think they were ever really, maybe they said at one point that the Chitari were a hive mind, but I don't No, they remember, didn't. They did I don't remember them ever saying that. At least in the Phantom Menace, like, you knew that that was the goal, right? Like, right. You, because you know, they're, they're robots. They're robots. Right. You, it, it make, it, if you destroy the signal, they can't function yeah it's it's it was like a miniature version of like destroying the death star sort of where like you know we destroy this big ship and mm-hmm. it kind of resolves the main conflict of the story or right. of, of that story anyway but with the avengers I, I don't really feel like it really um set mm-hmm. it up in the same way and that's besides the point of this episode but um and i I feel like sorry this is just going on for a little bit more of a rant of avengers but i feel like they did that a lot as much gripe as age of ultron gets and hate it gets from certain fans there that's one thing i did appreciate in it they literally had to destroy every single trace of ultron and not just one big version of him yeah to to destroy them all they literally had to destroy every single piece of him to resolve the problem and that set up a really nice scene at the end with uh with vision um, mm-hmm. and him him encounter like confronting the final piece of ultron i thought that was mm-hmm. cool it really was but okay um, away from the the avengers back to doctor who back to doctor who though. uh-huh i, I really there was a little scooby-doo chase at the beginning i kind of like that i kind of enjoyed that i i know they do and even like more on the nose one later in Doctor Who. I don't. I don't. I think that's that. Love and Monsters. That might be Love and Monsters. That's. I think that's like the one bit of Love and Monsters I actually enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, like where it's it's really on the nose with like the hallway and they're going in one door and coming out another. Yeah, it's definitely um, Love and Monsters. <laughs> yeah, but there there was like a little homage to it here that, mm-hmm. I, that I enjoyed. Mm-hmm. And also just the fact that the the slovene i can't remember their names the the acting prime minister and the general dude i i'm i really should have been writing down those names um but like they're like this man killed all these people that's why he went out and brought a lot of soldiers back in here because he yeah. killed them all i'm like how dumb are these soldiers to be like yeah this di- this guy definitely killed them that's why he came out and said hey help help and then he then he goes by he's like just kidding i actually killed these guys arrest me yeah and like i i kind of get it as far as like if you're if your general gives you an order you kind of like follow it without question right like but i kind of i kind of get it but yeah it, it was a little bit weird mm-hmm also we had a we had some more fart jokes everyone let's let me check the counter five we had five a, more fart jokes a lot less this time but still like yeah no the other one had five more than there should have been <laughs> yeah the first one had 15 i believe yeah i think we got to 15 on our count um and also you have amazing amazing lines like i need to be naked Every time they said naked, it made me so uncomfortable. Not because I'm uncomfortable with nudity, but because like just them, the idea of them like as as a species getting naked is just ugh. like the combination of of their whole design and like the way they said it, and it was just like ugh, mm-hmm. no, don't. <clears throat> uh, mm-hmm. Um, 
I enjoyed the idea of um, like this space crime family. Mm-hmm. I I kind of feel like maybe if they had gone more in like a like a Godfather type direction, it could have been a lot of fun. Um, instead of like the way they went with it, with them just being like cackling and farting and because <laughs> I feel like there was some like especially the um oh the the blonde lady I don't remember her name right but, um especially her performance was very good um yeah I thought I thought she played a she she had the opportunity to play a very intimidating mm-hmm. like crime boss type character but they really didn't like mm-hmm let her shine because they they preferred to have them like laughing maniacally and and farting instead Mm, right Um, and And i I just feel like it was a missed opportunity and speaking of which of like them being like crime syndicates and everything yeah um that that you saying that made me think does their designs remind you of any other green crime syndicate alien crime lords Kind of huddish, yeah. I yeah. Feel that. yeah, very I'm huddish. Not. Um, yeah, I didn't even think about that, but now, now that you say it, I, I see it. I totally see it. Yeah. Um, I don't know that they had that in mind, and like, obviously, it's a much worse design than the huts. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, no, you're you're right about that, especially like, um, the baby hut from um the clone wars series although to be fair that came out in 2008 this came out in 2005 yeah i mean i don't think there's any connection there but like there's definitely like these things had a very like baby face appearance Mm -hmm. Um, i mean a lot of things take from star wars because star wars star wars is what kept science fiction alive like sure you had classic doctor who at the time you had lost in space you had star trek but the it the popularity for those things really started to go downhill right until star yeah. wars came around star wars was kind of the the new spark within the science fiction genre that kind of like mm-hmm. ushered in a new era um mm-hmm. of not just like science fiction but science fiction kind of being taken more seriously mm-hmm. right yeah, and I, like I don't think Star Wars did all of that like single-handedly, but it mm-hmm. definitely was like one of the big things that that kind of brought science fiction more into like the the public attention. And you know, we also right. see others like like probably Terminator was a big one. Um, mm-hmm. and Alien, b- Back to the Future, The Predator. The future. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Like we we saw sort of see this new like age of kind of more uh, more popular science fiction stuff and, and def- like more for general audiences and right like right no and then and then you also had um kid shows like uh he-man masters of the universe uh transformers yeah. and go yes even go bots and a lot of other things she-ra a lot of other things and I almost, I would almost say that like probably the, um, the first or the, the Doctor Who movie, um, was probably like kind of riding that wave a little bit. Like they saw, mm-hmm. um, yeah. especially with it being like more marketed, like to Americans. Um, oh, definitely. Yeah. They, they, they probably saw like this wave of science fiction and was like, Hey, my, now might be a good time to bring back Doctor Who. And like, <laughs> they were wrong. They, yeah. They, it it they, wasn't time. They, they needed a few more years. Yeah. But I think when Doctor Who kind of came back, they probably had that same thing in mind where it's like, we're, we're going to make a Doctor Who that's maybe more for a general audience than what we used to. Mm-hmm. But they didn't direct it towards Americans. They directed it right. back they, to, towards themselves. Yeah, they kept it within, <coughs> um, kept it within like a very not a super British tone because there are some jokes that are like you know maybe like some Americans can appreciate, but mm-hmm. like for the most part they they are kind of catering it toward right um, toward Britain, right? 
And okay, my next note was the password Buffalo. Not why? a very strong password. No. And also, why is it the password for everything they needed? Like I mean, you'd think someone would you'd think unit would have different passwords for everything. Yeah, and like, like you'd have a level one password, you'd have a level two password, and so and on and so forth. I feel like t- for something that like um that secure like you're using it to launch a missile like you would that's something you would probably only be able to access from yeah. certain points like i don't feel like you could access that from just any computer right um, and like it would take a much more complicated password i don't mm-hmm. there was a lot about the whole missile launch that didn't quite make sense to me um, mm-hmm. the other thing was like why did the missile have so much range mm-hmm because it, it was being launched from, I don't remember if it was a ship or a sub. I or think they that. said a sub. And, like, it flew, you know, all the way, like, from the ocean over, like, the, over the cliffs and all the way into, like, the middle of, um, the middle of London. Like, I, I don't feel like it should have been able to do that. No, definitely. That far. Definitely not. Yeah, yeah. That, that seemed really, really weird to me. Mm-hmm. And why did Jackie open the door? Like, go see who it is. It's three in the morning. We'll go tell them that. I'm like, come on, it's obvious. <laughs> uh, and like, she's so I... surprised that it's him. And I'm like, oh no, help, police, murder. I saw a joke recently that was like, it was a headline of an article saying how like millennials don't just open their doors if they don't. Uh-huh. aren't expecting company and uh, somebody captioned it like this is why we don't have serial killers anymore. Right? Millennials are like, killing the serial killer No, I literally will not, I won't answer my door. I look out the window like cause yeah. we, don't, we don't have like a little eye hole piece in our front door so I have to look out the window or something. Yeah, when I lived in my apartment I would always check the people and like mm-hmm. usually it was like you know people from the church. <laughs> next door mm-hmm. but um i always checked though because like i don't know who you are or why you're here you're probably like you know either right. like trying to get me to take some survey or um sell me something or maybe you're here to murder me mm-hmm. like, and like whenever i, I came up door. whenever i came and visited you always knew i was coming because you lived like 40 minutes away so i didn't i didn't want to just like drop in yeah, like it, if some people don't just drop in on me, like that's not really, and I feel like that's not really a thing around here either. Like you don't, I know there are some places where like people will just drop in on each other, but around here, like usually mm-hmm. you say, you know, I'm coming over, be there in like 20 minutes or whatever. Oh, so, no, like, that's, it's definitely happened a lot over here. I've, I've got some extended family that does that and uh, just some, some people my dad knows. Yeah, yeah. My my well, people I know don't really do that. They mm-hmm. always like call and say, "Hey, I'm coming mm-hmm. over." Um, well, my dad's yeah, like the I, more kind of guy. He, my dad's like the go-to guy. Like someone's like, "Yeah, let's just go over there and see how he's doing or whatnot," you know. Um, but yeah, if somebody rang my doorbell at three a.m., I would not be answering it. No, I don't. I don't care who they are. They. <laughs> I don't care you, if they're my best friend. Yeah. Aww. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, I would, would. I would probably. I would probably answer it for you. No, I would definitely call beforehand, though. <laughs> yeah, like I, I don't know anybody that would like just pop in at my door at three a.m. Yeah, you know me. I, I, when I go to sleep, I, I enjoy my, I enjoy sleep. So I, I would not be up over at your house that late, with yeah. no reason. Yeah, like if I had an emergency situation and I needed to like be at somebody's house at three a.m., I would still call. Like I'm still gonna make sure. Yeah. That, like, they yeah. Are awake. <clears throat> um, right. Okay. Off that tangent. Um, that was quite a tangent. <laughs> yeah. I love that the doctor uh, can just narrow all these things down just by these facts of figuring out what particular planet this species is from. Yeah, and I. It was kind of weird that he recognized like the planet, but didn't recognize the species, which maybe it's one that's like spread out across multiple planets. But um, Mm -hmm. that was a little bit odd to me as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, just look at humans. You see a lot of humanoid aliens. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's true. Like even the Time Lords, they're literally they look human. And it could be too, like maybe he knew more about like the planet than like the species that are living there. Because I mean, true. surely there were multiple like mm-hmm. species living there, and maybe like once he could narrow down the planet, he could like kind of be like, okay, this is like their climate. This is kind of the type of environment they live in. Then this is like what mm-hmm. I can figure out from there. Right. Um, Cause I mean, it, if we're assuming that every planet is like earth, then there's going to be like a lot of different types of creatures on the planet. But like, yeah, we can kind of figure out like probably mostly carbon based, you know, mm. um, most of them on land are going to have like this type of, internal organs and immune system and whatever and the ones like living in the sea are going to kind of be like this um Mm -hmm. right so i mean i'm sure there's a lot the doctor could figure out just by knowing Mm -hmm. and of course they're saved by farting like i'm telling you like Harriet Jones is like, you know, when they fought, the, it smells so bad. It doesn't smell right. It smells completely different. It smells more like this. And that's what saves them. I'm Why? All the do- I'm all for the doctor coming up with a clever solution to a problem. Like, I feel like that's kind of like what defines how the doctor does things. Um, but that was a bit much. Yes. The whole, the whole scene was a bit much for my Davies, face. what were you on when you wrote this? Uh, um, also, wasn't just wasn't really into, like, the Doctor or Rose this episode. I thought they were mm-hmm. kind of both being really annoying and unreasonable in a way. Yeah, um, they, were, they were big jerks in this episode. Um, particularly to Mickey, but also kind of to Jackie as well. Like, uh-huh. I... I don't know that Jackie necessarily deserves better, but Mickey definitely deserves better. Oh, Mickey deserves so much better. And I, I do find myself sympathizing a lot more with Jackie this time around too. Like I, I can really see her, her concern. Just like I mean, mm. I'm not, I'm not a parent, but like I can see, I can really see her concern and like how, you know, what wrote. Rose traveling with the doctor without really telling Jackie what's going on or like when she's coming mm-hmm. back or like, I, I understand where she's coming from. And I, I am glad in the end, the doctor did invite Mickey along. Yeah. I think they, I think we definitely see the doctor starting to respect Mickey and like maybe not quite see him as an equal, but like we right. definitely see his respect for Mickey growing. And I, mm-hmm. I do appreciate that, but I, I don't know, just like the, the journey up to that was very mm-hmm. kind of, kind of annoying to me. Mm-hmm. And also, but, sorry, continue. I mean, to I know like, I know nine is just like the sassy doctor and sass is kind of his thing, but mm-hmm. there were times with Mickey, it felt a little bit malicious. <laughs> yeah, it really did. And, also, can we just talk about how right the doctor is about when humans get scared, they lash out? Oh, yeah, for sure. He's been around humans enough to mm-hmm. know what they're like and know mm-hmm. how they're going to react to things. Mm. And how, and how like, the, the thing about aliens, like, are causing people to stay home and, like, there's literally no one on the streets. Yeah. And they're staying home you know, something other people should be doing. <laughs> and like our, our U S government actually tried that last week. They gave confirmation for UFOs and people are like aliens and people are just like, eh, like most people would be like, Oh my gosh, aliens. But now people are just like, eh. It's such a weird time to be living in where the news of, you know, UFOs is not really enough to phase people because everything yeah. else is just so weird right now. Mm-hmm. Um, which I mean, like the thing about UFOs is they are unidentified, so it's not like it doesn't the, mean it's, it's an alien spacecraft. Yeah, we just don't know what it is. So it's, it's right. not like the government was like dropping the news that aliens exist. Mm-hmm. That's that's not what that means. It means that there's a flying ob- 
object that we have footage of that we cannot identify. Right. I mean, it could be a child's, it could be a drone for all we know, a toy drone. Yeah. Who um, knows? Or right. it could be the doctor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, whenever I'm about to achieve victory, I'm, I'm going to say this for the rest of my life. Victory should be naked. Oh, no. Please don't. <laughs> I hate it so much. <laughs> That's why I'm going to do it. No. Um, <coughs> let's see. Yeah, and like um, we were talking about how Rose and um, the Doctor were just kind of the worst in this episode. Jackie and Mickey were the best part of this episode. I really enjoyed Jackie and Mickey and I enjoyed their like interactions. I thought there mm-hmm. was some really nice interactions between them um, and seeing Jackie kind of like also start to respect Mickey a little more. Yeah. Um, Especially since she like completely accused him of murder. Yeah. And spread awful rumors about him. I'm going to be saying it a lot during the time that Mickey is on this show, but Mickey deserves better. Oh, he definitely does. I totally agree. It also really bothered me the way at the end, the doctor was being kind of manipulative to Rose. Um, Yes. When she was wanting to just like have dinner with her family that her mom was cooking and settle down for a minute after a very stressful event. And the doctor was just like, well, we could do that. Or I could take you to this nebula where you'll, be shot off into space and it would be amazing and all this. And, and Rose is like, okay. I'm like, can, can you let her rest for five minutes? Can, do you not have time to have a dinner with a family right. and just settle down for a minute? No. Okay. Well, I guess mm-hmm. we're just going to go straight on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it was obvious that Rose wanted to do that wanted to spend some time with her family right the doctor like i don't know he just seemed kind of a little bit manipulative and possessive in that moment Mm -hmm. and again yeah sorry continue where it's like you could do that boring thing you know and spend time with your family or you can Mm -hmm. do the super fun thing that i want to do right and also um that just goes right into why I don't like Rose because Rose will just follow whatever the doctor says no matter what. She's just I don't like her because of that cuz she just she starts not caring about the people who care about her and just completely abandons them. Yeah, I mean I I see that but I definitely think the doctor shares Oh, he definitely life. does. Um this time around especially Mm-hmm. I don't know. He he just it just kind of rubbed me the wrong way that um he wasn't really he wasn't really taking her feelings and her needs into consideration and was just and basically like, saying, "Well, my idea is better, so we should do that." And right. Not really leaving Rose with a whole lot of choice in the matter. And I mean, I don't know if this is part of like him like just coming off of the the time war or something like that, you know, still trying to learn, but he's just very, he's, it was such a jerk move. It was, yeah. It it felt, I don't know, it, I didn't really like that. And I think it is, like, it is to do with a post-time war doctor. I don't think he really does that so much later, but, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I didn't like it. <laughs> also, Rose, Harriet Jones, and the Doctor should be dead. They should. There's no way they could have survived that. It was weird that... Um, like they should have at least come out with some scratches or some bruises. No, they were perfectly fine. It was weird that Harriet, I think it was Harriet, that said that the that room could not protect them. Like It wasn't yeah. strong enough to, to withstand that, but then it did, and... And then when they walk out of the room, like it's completely steel. But when you see Harriet grab on the side of it, it's very flimsy. Like it's made out of just tin. Yeah, that was weird. And I get that they were trying to like, trying to up the tension or whatever, but Mm -hmm. it was almost like 
we were lied to as viewers. Yeah, it was it was too much. It was too much. Yeah. Um it's it's just it's weird that they said one thing and then it like turned out to be the opposite and it was actually a really secure, strong room that could withstand it. A missile. Mm. Right. Okay, that's all I have for the non spoiler section. I've only got two notes for the spoiler section. Um, I don't know okay. about you. No, that's all I've got. Let's get into spoilers. Spoiler warning. I can't believe that Rose completely dies at the end of this episode again. <laughs> oh, I mean, like, really, they they should they should be dead. Yeah. There's no <laughs> way that... Whatever. It's yeah. fine. Okay. Uh, my first spoiler note is that the Doctor does kill. Like, a lot of people uh, seem yeah. to forget that the Doctor will kill. It's just he tries his hardest not to. It's always his last resort. Yeah. This isn't um, Batman. This isn't Batman. Batman shouldn't, should never kill. The Doctor is not Batman. Yeah, Batman's rule number one is don't kill, and the Doctor's rule number one is the Doctor lies. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we're going to have some angry uh, Zack Snyder fans being like, no, the Doctor kills. Release this hashtag release the Snyder cut. We're going to have some of those. <laughs> For all the Snyder fans joining us, the Snyder Cut does not exist. I'm sorry to tell you. I just received word from Zack Snyder himself. He called me on my cell phone and said, hey, I hear you're talking about the Snyder Cut. Tell everybody it doesn't exist. And so I thought I'd pass that on to you all. And even if it uh, does exist, it's not what you think it is. Thank you, Zack Snyder, for, for informing us of, of the news finally. We've all been on the edge of our seats. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, you know, the doctor's choosing, my second note is the doctor choosing, like trying to decide, save the world and lose Rose and whatnot. I, I just thought that was another prime example of the choice he had to make, like with the 50th anniversary and everything of choosing to destroy Gallifrey to save the rest of the universe. Yeah, and it I was think, a lighter uh, moment, but it was still a good moment of that. And I think that's what some of the most interesting moments in Doctor Who come down to is making a really tough choice mm -hmm. between um, basically between two possible futures for mm -hmm. the universe and for the Doctor. You know, is mm -hmm. the Doctor going to give up? something that's really important to him for the greater good or um is the doctor going to say no screw the greater good this is what i want and we even get that a few times in the future yeah we get we, that with the waters of mars and then again with hell bent which ultimately yeah. both backfire right and i think that's what makes makes the doctor really interesting as a character because there are there are legitimately times where you're not quite sure which way the doctor's gonna go mm. um, i mean we kind of know which way the doctor's gonna go for mm. the most part but it's i don't know it's it's always a nice dramatic tension to me to and there's always build up to it there's always some nice build up to it unlike yeah. a certain episode that premiered a couple months ago Mm -hmm. where it just came out of left field and nowhere and you're like wait what why are you doing this there was there's no re what, what but we'll get that now? in we'll get into that later we'll get into that later <laughs> that's all the notes i have i don't know about you uh yeah that's all i really have to talk about for this one yeah i feel like this episode is most mostly just going to be us going on tangents about um, things <laughs> oh, I will say the the spoiler thing I was talking about earlier. I'm not going to really oh. discuss it at the moment, but um, right, it it was the end of uh, season five when um, uh, when the doctor like goes into the Pandorica. And, oh, like, okay, yeah, that is a good example because like the way the time next episode, passed. yeah, the way the next episode starts and like everything is like way different and we don't quite understand what happens i thought that was mm -hmm. really fun right that is that is a very good moment yeah i really enjoy like that two-parter 
Um, and I, I enjoy when, when Doctor Who does things like that. I feel like there are other examples of it, but really mm-hmm. just kind of throws you into the solution, but like kind of not in the way you expect. Like it, mm-hmm. things are working out way differently than you expect and you kind of have to piece together, okay, what happened? Mm-hmm. And that's one thing I love about Doctor Who two-parters. You don't know if they're connected because they don't have it said, and they don't usually have it said in the title part one and then part two, because always that you're always expecting it. But if it's not like that, you're not going to expect it. Yeah. And I, I think Doctor Who cliffhangers, you know, because of the nature of the show, you know, not every episode is going to have a cliffhanger. And right. when it does, it tends to, unless you know it's coming, it tends to kind of surprise you. Mm-hmm. Unless you like know what the, who wrote each episode and you're like, oh, okay, the next episode's a Stephen Moffat episode. If you see, usually see like two Stephen Moffat episodes in a row, you can usually gather it's a two-parter. Right. But if you're just binging through the show and not mm-hmm. really paying attention to like to the writers or what's coming mm-hmm. next, then yeah, you're probably not going to realize, oh, this is part one. And, Right. We're going to have a cliffhanger. Mm-hmm. And that that's the thing with like um, the end of time. It literally says part one and part two. In Spyfall, it says part one and part two. Yeah. I don't like that so much when they're advertised as a two-parter. Mm-hmm. I think it's more fun to be surprised. Right. Okay, everyone. Well, I think that's it for today. Um, that was Doctor Who uh, season one, episode five, World War Three. Join us next time for Season 1, Episode 6, Dalek.